I'd like to welcome everyone who <coughs> came here tonight. Is everyone English speaking or does anyone need uh, translations? Anyone needs translations for that? in French or whatever William is offered to he'll just sit next to you and whisper into your ear. <laughs> well, it's a real blessing to be back here. I was uh, hosted here quite a while ago and then uh, this year I was sharing in the kitchen. There's been quite a lot of world travels, but uh, I've talked to uh, Irene and Angelina. They've been saying, when are you coming up? And we've tried to set a time and uh, this time it just click, click, click. Everything dropped in, and uh, it's just been a wonderful time, a wonderful year for me, and just meeting so many people. It's when your mind, when you free your mind of judgments and uh, all kinds of associations, really what you see is a different world. You don't see the same world that you saw before, and literally it's like Jesus saying before you get the you know, speck out of your brother's eye, get the beam out of your own, and when you really do get that beam out, then it's really a spectacular view. It's, a, it's just lots and lots of witnesses of love everywhere. And where this is all leading, where this transformation is leading, is, is to a point uh, where Jesus says, do not see error. We're so used to, with the human condition, you know, perceiving judging and perceiving <coughs> error, and then trying to do the inner work to clear away the uh, debris, and definitely you do have to start wherever you find yourself and perceive yourself, but, but where this is all leading is to a point of such uh, pivot everywhere, and because the world is just a mirror that reflects the mind, so it's really beautiful when you really hang in there and do the inner work, and, and it's not like you stop judging, it's just that you get to a point where you realize that you never were really capable of it in the first place, and good news is that you're safe, you know, your life doesn't turn to chaos if you don't have judgment, uh, your life just turns to bliss without judgment, because you see everything and everyone as part of your own mind and your own awareness. So, uh, it's really, really beautiful. And uh, these, these gatherings have involved questions and answers over many years, for about 13 years now and everything, but lately I've been doing gatherings where we've had uh, just lots of profound silence and reverence and uh, end up having, just looking around and doing some eye gazing and, uh, but before you come to that, really it, it's good to give your mind permission to ask questions and uh, just uh, let unconscious things come up without keeping a lid on it, without protecting anything anymore. Just gently allow things to come up and uh, it's like down in uh, Argentina they asked me, you know, how is this different from brainwashing? <laughs> and I said, I said, well, it's kind of like mind washing, uh, letting your mind be washed with the light and uh, offering up all the darkness to the light so that it's cleansed and cleared and purified. As Jesus had taught, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. So that's really all it is. It's just uh, coming to clear your mind. And... Uh, so these gatherings are very practical gatherings in uh, asking about divine principles, asking about uh, mainly how do you put these things into practice. And so we generally talk about the mind and we talk about metaphysics, uh, what's going on with the mind and what seems to be going on with this world, what's underneath it. And we really talk a lot about practical application. Because that's really where the rubber meets the road. When you really have to get to the point where you have your thoughts or your concepts or your theologies, but you have sporadic or inconsistent experiences of peace and joy, and you want it to be consistent. You've seen great glimpses of it, and the, the real prayer is, Ah, oh, Lord, let me know this as my life. Uh, let me know this as my constant experience. And that's really where we get into not only the, the principles and the metaphysics, but the practical application of applying this with everything in your life and holding no exceptions apart from it. So you let the stuff come up or you notice your judgments, your grievances, but you, you have a, a way then of, of going inward and of seeing that nothing's being done to you. 
and you can start to get in touch with what's going on in your mind and then release that, which is extremely empowering because it means that uh, you are responsible for your state of mind and that there's nothing in the world that can make you feel anyway. When your mind is trained and when you realize uh, really the full extent of the power of the mind, then it's really a glorious experience. And until that point, it's just lots and lots and lots of opportunities to practice uh, reclaiming the power that you have. And uh, we were off, William and I were off today uh, looking at sites and just talking about the <coughs> years of practice of A Course in Miracles, um, all the, the inner work that it takes, uh, not about trying to skip over things or get off into distractions or uh, kind of decoy, allow your mind to be decoyed, but just basically hanging with the basic uh, uh, teaching and application and uh, just continuing to extend it so that you don't make any exceptions to it. Because that's really all this is about. That's what waking up means, is just starting to realize that truth is true and you can't make any exceptions to the truth. Uh, love is real. Love is really all that there is, and whatever <coughs> appears as an opposite to love, or appears to contradict love, is just uh, an assumption or a belief that needs to be raised up to the light, needs to be exposed or questioned. So, these are real practical gatherings, and they have been for many years, where uh, I can share whatever you'd like. I'm here to join with you and to be of full service to you in terms of uh, questions, uh, how do you put this into application, concepts and topics. We start from many different angles, uh, many different topics, and we kind of work it in again to empowerment, to seeing that you have a very powerful mind, and that the mind we share is, is one with uh, the mind of Christ and the mind of God, and we are not at the mercy of this world. We are not at the mercy of uh, images. We have the power to have these images retranslated in a very loving, beautiful way, in which uh, it's all great, it's all wonderful, and you can feel that love everywhere. So uh, I'm here to join with you, and uh, it's the fun part of this is uh, whatever questions you want to ask or any kind of topics you want to bring up, then away we go. We just give it over to the Holy Spirit and. And watch what happens. This world, you know, our way of looking at things, emotions, and so on. Uh, there's another way, and the other way is to be guided by someone who is not our personality. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Yes, I think the, when people think of guidance, a lot of times <coughs> they they think of uh, hearing inner an inner voice or inner prompts. Um, I think one of the first things we can talk about is that uh, the spirit within you, the Holy Spirit, the higher power, that uh, that guide that knows the way that would be helpful to uh, transcend all fear and all pain and, and hurt, um, that guide is wanting to reach you in many, many different ways. And will use everything of this world uh, to the extent that you can uh, release the limitations and the parameters that you have placed on this experience through belief. So uh, a lot of times people feel frustrated if they they meditate for many years or they're uh, uh, practicing A Course in Miracles or some uh, path, yoga or the, all of the many different varieties of paths, and they feel frustrated when they're not getting a clear sense of guidance and direction or maybe not hearing a voice uh, speaking to them. And uh, it's like, well, what have I got to do? Uh, if you call out and make, make prayers and ask questions and you don't seem to, to hear that voice, you know, that's a good place to start with the whole question of guidance. A Course in Miracles is one tool that we have shared, William and I, over the years. And uh, in one sense, that is a very direct sense of your, of your higher self or the Holy Spirit speaking to you through those words. And so, even though words are illusions and they're called symbols of symbols, twice removed from reality, uh, like William was saying today, well, I need the words. Those are the things I understand. So, uh, my experience was of plunging in and really working with the Course very intensively, immersing myself in it, 
uh, the first two and a half years reading it for eight hours a day, and, uh, and, and had done a lot of work prior to that experience as well. So that for me, it started coming through in terms of a voice speaking to me, directing me, telling me where to go, and who to call, and what to do. Like having a little bird on your shoulder uh, that's just <laughs> sitting over there, just chirping away. A little friendly bird <laughs> that, uh, that is just very gently guiding. Um, but for a lot of people, it's not, that, it's not their experience that they have this constant voice uh, speaking to them, uh, providing them all this direction where to go, what to do, and so forth. And yet the Spirit can reach you in so many ways, uh, including uh, if you open up, take the parameters off, I, songs and music, uh, movies, um, you know, bumper stickers, billboards, uh, signs on the side, <laughs> signs of, the on the side of the bus, right? <laughs> that Maureen just experienced. Uh, you ain't seen nothing yet, was the, the sign that she, she had, right? Right before I arrived. Uh, it, it's great because once you start to take the parameters off, and also your feelings, uh, intuitions, sometimes you make it, uh, the hairs stand up on your arm or, or a tingle down the spine, um, things that happen in your body, which is just kind of a way of pay attention, you know, pay attention, this is important. Uh, when you start to take the parameters off, you, you realize that. Uh, you can start to relax a bit, because if you're not hearing the voice, uh, there's many ways that the Spirit can still reach you. And, and you want to just be as willing as you can to pay attention to the clues, and the signs, and the symbols. And then I think, you know, as you continue on, you get more and more devotional on this path, then uh, for some it's, it's a feeling, or uh, uh, just a certainty, or a knowingness that they feel. Not always times of voice. They may just have a few thoughts and then a feeling of, of certainty, or of surety coming in. Uh, for others, there's uh, they may just cry out and and then they're really open to hearing the spirit speak through brothers and sisters. So they may have a, a very sincere prayer, or meet somebody that they haven't seen for a while or on the streets, and then they hear this uh, clear direction coming, you know, through seemingly somebody else. But it just opens up the parameters to, gee, I can, I'm going to be guided and led, and I just have to be willing to, to hear, or to see, or to receive the messages, the little signposts along the way. And it's great to think that you don't have to have necessarily uh, somebody literally in your mind telling you what to do at every instant, uh, because that's generally not the case, and it's, it's actually quite rare. And of course, Jesus says, you know, very few can hear the voice for God directly. Because there's so many ego interferences, so many layers and layers and layers. But, if you're just willing to move in the direction of being shown and opening, then uh, that's where I think you can you start to make those, those inroads. And, uh, and I think most people have had some experience of that, or some degree of, of experiencing that. really where you go, or what you even do, or who you see, it's, it's learning to follow that inner guidance, and be totally sustained from that inner guidance, because that inner guidance, that intuition, that higher power, knows our greatest interest, knows our, our awakening, knows everything that is helpful, and so becoming dependent on that, becoming God-dependent, you might say, is really what this is all about. So when we both heard, uh, seemingly independently, you know, go east, 
And he was basically saying, likewise, uh, you need to become just as dependent on the voice inside your mind, on the, the Holy Spirit, uh, to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's a very simple, direct uh, reference to guidance, to becoming dependent on the guidance in that direction. So it's just adorable when you think about it that way, that, that all we're really opening to here is God dependence, and uh, not the kind of anthropomorphic God that's in a lot of theologies and religions, or the kind of God that you know, gets upset and zaps a tribe here or there, but a very loving, loving God that always uh, just wills perfect happiness for you. Doesn't will that any, any country invade any other country, or doesn't will that uh, this plane should crash, or this and that, but just wills for perfect happiness. And also has placed a guide in the mind that knows the way. And all we have to do is surrender and yield into that uh, guidance, and that's, that's it. That's all she wrote. I had the same kind of guidance happen on the way here tonight. We got in the car, and Jeffrey and Terry were driving behind me, and we got into this intersection. We, got, we, got, we were approaching an intersection, and the light was fully green. We weren't in the intersection, we were only approaching. And the light was fully green, and then I, and it's dark. And I noticed that there was a car coming from the other direction, halfway into the middle of the intersection. I'm still approaching the intersection. The light is full green. And then I noticed the car, whoops, backing up out of the intersection. I thought, this is interesting. Do you see this? There's a car backing up out of the intersection. Okay, here we go. And off we went. We continued along. And then again, we were on this road up here. We were on Chapel. And we were coming up, and we are coming up Chapel. And again, there's another car backing up on them. Well, there are two cars backing up. Okay, this is interesting. And now you're telling the story about going in one direction and again to come back. And I'm, so I'm listening. And I'm thinking, okay, well, what is this? And oh, it's about being open to the undoing. Okay. Yeah, it's very different from kind of a, like having a linear direction. Yeah, just open to undoing. Direction less. And earlier tonight, the thought went through it about. Um, I don't know if it was you, David, or the, the, the movie we watched last night, where there was something talking about addiction is the inability to stop something. Yeah. Whatever it is that you're doing, whatever you can't stop, that's an addiction. So here's this card. Okay, and this other card. Okay. And as I was taking a 15 minute nap, you know that I think in, in terms of gravity, physics, that's the, you know, one of my entrance ramps mm -hmm. into this. And I was thinking about how undoing can have six directions. It can, it can come from six directions. In order to be fully able to reverse in any position, it seems. So if what we're doing is, I don't know, Mirko, stay with me on this. <laughs> if what we're doing is standing, then what we're doing is we're in a relationship to gravity in this direction. So if we can go in this direction, then this is reversible. And if we're lying down flat on our back, then we're in a relationship to gravity where it's going in this direction. So if we can, it's going in this direction. So if we can go in this direction, so I guess that would be levitation. <laughs> Then we're not addicted to sleeping. And if we're lying in this direction, then gravity is going like this. So it's just this positional referencing. So it's just letting go of positional referencing. Which, which can seem very ingrained. which is something you've believed in for a long time, uh, where you have some affirmations or some goals that you're holding in mind, but you have a lot of unconscious thoughts and beliefs that, that are really held very dear and have been reinforced very deeply. It becomes so habitual. Uh, that's why this is very much, pretty much raising the darkness to the light and learning to question a lot of those assumptions and, uh, and, and loosen them. Just, even in the beginning, just loosen your mind from some of those assumptions. Uh, that's extremely helpful. It will serve you so well as you go forward. Uh, believing so there's not a sense of set fixed position for these. From which to reference. Yeah, from which to reference everything that you seem to think and say and do. Yeah, no need for context. 
Jeffrey was talking about in context life. Yes. And, uh, like for example, in this world, there's a lot of attention that's placed on nutrition, you know, eating right. And basically, he <coughs> was describing in this movie that after years of so called emotional abuse or of holding on to fear thoughts and doubt thoughts and attack thoughts, uh, self debasing thoughts, um, this has the impact of, of um, uh, the, the receptor sites of the, of, the, of the molecules of the cells of the body uh, just uh, shutting down or not being able to receive uh, nutrition and receive things because they, they just have shut down from all this, uh, all these peptides and all these things that have been going on for years. And at one point the scientist said, so it's not so much what you eat. Because uh, at this point, when this has been going on for years, you know, you're, the, these cells are incapable of receiving uh, the protein and the nutrition that they want. So even scientists now are, are pointing to the power of the mind and the power of thought. And how when you change your tune, so to speak, and you change your attitude, uh, this has effects on the whole world you perceive. Uh, not only the body, but, but the world that seems to surround you, the environment will change. And this is a whole turnaround from the way that we all were trained, thinking that there was a set objective world, and we just had to do what we could do to take care of our personal selves in this objective world. Now we're seeing from quantum physics, from A Course in Miracles, that this whole world that's being perceived is a reflection of our thoughts and beliefs, and that we need to do the inner work <laughs> if we're going to experience happiness and joy on a consistent basis. Fine. And so uh, they came out with cameras and the journalist came out. And the journalist was just felt so much peace when she came out to this house where I was staying and just felt so in love with the family that was hosting me and all the people she traveled out there with that they got her all dressed up for, you know, a blouse and everything to go on to the camera. I guess maybe this was in television interview here. And uh, she felt so much peace that she just started asking me all kinds of questions and at some point in the middle of the interview she just leaned her head back and just closed her eyes <laughs> and just was like, oh. <laughs> just like feeling all this bliss and love and everything. And um, so it was, we did discuss a lot of things because she asked a lot of questions about how it relates how do you do this in this world? And ask a lot of deep questions that way. We, we got into a lot of that. And then interestingly enough, um, I talked about letting go of the self-concept, letting go of the persona, the mask, the personality. And at one point uh, during one of the breaks, she said, uh, how do I uh, let go of the, the mask of a TV journalist? And, and uh, I thought, wow, here she's come on the interview and she's asking, she was feeling the peace and she was asking a very practical question for herself. And I said, well, what you're doing right now is a good example of it uh, because the topic we're talking about is enlightenment and awakening and you're here letting your skills in journalism be used uh, for this purpose. This will go out on the airwaves. This is a beautiful thing that you're doing. It's not like, you know, you have to just drop everything. Uh, we have to give it over to this higher power and let it be used for the peace and to share uh, how you come to forgive and everything. So a few days later, uh, I was getting ready. I met a, a pilot who talked to me for hours. But, uh, he gets different types of, he has a job, but he also flies around and takes aerial maps and everything. And he, he wanted to fly me to the ocean, uh, to a little naval base and to go over to the ocean. So he was coming to pick me up, and uh, the woman where I was staying was, like she said, the phone call came in, it was the, it was the journalist again from, the, from this interview, and she said she wanted to come over and spend some time, and I told her, you know, you were taking a flight to the ocean. I said, well, call her back and ask her if she wants to go on a trip to the ocean. And uh, she did, and she said, sure, just pick me up. So she got out of her professional uh, clothes the interview, and she had her sweatpants on, sweatshirt, and a bikini underneath, so that we were going to go over and jump in the ocean and romp around, go through the mountains. I, get, I got this from the natives out of the seas down there in the jungle. We flew over, it was like a tropical jungle, and flew over there, and it was, she just didn't speak much English, and I didn't speak much Spanish, but uh, we were able to, along with this pilot, communicate very well, and uh, landed, and it was very similar to Valentine's Day up here. It was uh, like love and friendship day down there. And this pilot who I just met brought bags of candy along. So I got to go to the 
airport, give candy out to all the people at the airport. And this journalist and I, who had just met a few days before, were going around passing out candy on Love and Friendship Day, landing uh, at an airport, going to a naval base where all these, they're there with their guns and their uniforms, and we're passing out candy to them, and they get these big smiles, and we're just going everywhere giving all this candy out, and just like two little kids, you know, it's like reverse of Halloween, or trick or treat. Uh, we were giving the treats away on Love and Friendship Day. Even the natives, we had to walk through little villages, hike through little villages towards the airport, or towards the, the ocean, to the little children, the mothers of the babies, mm -hmm. giving out the candy. And the whole day, just going to the warm tropical ocean and splashing around. And here's a journalist I had just met uh, a couple days before, and I'm out splashing in the waves, and she comes out and brings the sand, puts sand and mud all over her, and then comes out, puts it all over me, all over the pilot. I thought I was covered with mud too. I thought, well, here we are. And she came out with another scoop full of it on my head. <laughs> just like kids playing in, in a very loving, innocent way, of just in the spontaneity of the moment, just enjoying this very spontaneous trip to the ocean. And that's the kind of uh, example of the kind of life that we all can Live, the more we learn to trust that higher power, to, we learn to trust to be spontaneous, to not have everything so planned and prearranged, as if our whole life is pretty much set in stone, but to trust and just say, okay, I'm here to shine the light of love, uh, what do you got for me today? And then let the, the Spirit come through that. Words, if we could equate it with something, uh, to have a free will would be to have a will or an experience in your mind where you're happy, where you're constantly happy. And uh, even when I would hear people tell me, God's will for you is this, and God's will for you is that, I, I always had difficulty uh, uh, with this stuff that God's will for me was all these specific things. But when I really got a hold of the idea that God's will was for perfect happiness, I thought, well, I think I'd like to know that. Whatever it is, and however I get there. And that's what I would like to know. And then this other stuff in a lot of religions, uh, you know, where they say things like, uh, not my will, but thine be done, almost implying that, that our will and God's will is different. And uh, what I started to open to was the idea that, that my will and God's will were the same. Uh, if I was created by God, that by golly, God gave me uh, free will. And... Uh, that I noticed that, that the ego uh, belief system was, was based on control and manipulation and consequences, lots of fear of consequences. Mm -hmm. And there was no, I, I just realized that there couldn't be free will and all this fear of consequences. That free will would, would involve happiness and peace and joy, not these things. So, initially after ten years of college and lots of searching and lots of questions, kind of doing the Renaissance thing and taking a little bit of everything to kind of get a sample of everything the world had to offer, I realized that um, the problem wasn't in the world, that I had uh, an alien will in my mind. There was, a, there was an imposter uh, using the power of my mind, and that's why I wasn't experiencing freedom, because I was giving my mind, uh, my faith, over to this imposter. And at that point I realized that uh, I really didn't have to try to change the world, I just had to uncover the imposter. You know, uh, like the old Poco uh, comic strip, we have met the enemy and it is Usum. Uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, they asked Gandhi if there was a devil, if he believed in the devil, and Gandhi thought for a minute and said, the only, if there is a devil, the only devil is, uh, is running around in our own hearts. What a beautiful answer. Well, I decided if, if the devil was in my heart, I better uh, uh, cast him out. <laughs> because uh, I didn't want him messing with my free will. And initially, as I started working with the Course in Miracles, uh, I was very shy in high school and but most quiet in my senior class. I was very, uh, like most people, had fears of intimacy, uh, fears of, of lowering the mask, of just letting the real me shine. 
for fear of the past and what people would think and so forth. And I remember going to these course groups and this joy kind of coming through me and the voice for God starting to speak through me. It was really frightening. I was like, the feeling I had was, I am losing control of my life. But that control was the personality control, like David running the show, David steering the, the car or steering the boat. And the more I just relaxed into this joy and let it kind of come through me, it was as if, uh, kind of like the, that Shirley MacLaine movie, Out on a Limb, you know, where she's going down that, that road. I think she's with a, a man named David in the car, and, and David's saying, uh, let go of the wheel <laughs> on, on, a, on a dark road at night uh, that bends like this, let go of the wheel. Uh, but that's how it felt initially when I started to go to these course groups and let the voice for God start speaking through me. It felt like, whoa, ooh, something's going on here. But, but it felt like a loss of control. But I really had to trust and say, well, but my whole life has been controlled. Uh, maybe if I surrender and I learn to, to let this move through me, maybe that will lead to the free will. Uh, maybe that will show me true freedom. Because whatever I've done in the past, it has not brought me uh, freedom. I have, I had a couple degrees, I had uh, money to travel, I, I could see that my definition of freedom it very much involved freedom of the body. It's almost like an arrogant freedom. I'll do whatever I want to do, whenever I want, however I want to do it, you know, kind of a thing, a personal freedom. And yet, interestingly enough, I never really felt free, completely free with that uh, personal kind of, I'll do what I want, I'll do it my way. So I thought, what's the harm in uh, surrendering to this higher power and seeing if I can really experience a sense of freedom? So, I didn't really know at that time fully what I was getting into. I didn't know the full extent of, how, of the unconscious mind. I did not know the full extent of how deep this root of control and conflict and hatred and pain went. It's a very, very deep root. You know, you, and you don't get the dandelion by just plucking the, the stem off. <laughs> You've got to get down to the core of this thing. So, I kind of came to the point where I thought, I've got nothing better to do with my, my time than get to the bottom of this. There's something fishy with this world anyway, and I don't know what it is, but I'm going to get to the bottom of it if it's the last thing that I do. So I just launched on this journey of inner discovery uh, in search of free will, in search of an experience where I had free will. And the deeper I got into it, and the more I tuned into this higher power, the more it was apparent that, that everything that was unfolding was part of a prearranged plan designed for my highest good and for the highest good of everyone. It, it was like God's plan, or there was a higher plan underneath all this running around and trying to grab while the getting's good and look out for number one and, you know, all this kind of uh, defensive posture. And the more I yielded into this, the more my life just got happier and happier. I felt more and more free. I had to face thoughts about loneliness and all the typical human uh, feelings. I had to face them all. Uh, through relationships, through travel, through hermitage experiences of being out in the woods by myself with no running water and with the snakes and the bugs and, you know, just, I thought, but this is an adventure of self-discovery, <coughs> like the Greeks talked about, know thyself. And I'm going to go fully for this because what else do I have to use my time for? You know, I really want to know this. So that's, I would say, in the end, what where I found free will was by, it was always there, and I just had it covered over. And I had to peel the onion of consciousness about all these false definitions that I had covered it over with. That it was always there waiting, saying, here I am, uh, I'm happiness, and I'm your will for you. Uh, I'm here. Uh, come find me, I haven't gone anywhere. And it was more of a negation or of removing the blocks, like having discovery like. 
like freedom, like I, I really saw that it was dependent on freedom of the body. And intimacy I had so wired up with bodies as well, and even peace of mind. I kept thinking, I'm going to move to a peaceful place. Well, you know, where in this world uh, is a peaceful place? You know, it's a sneaky, it's kind of a seductive idea. But, you know, you can okay. sail the oceans blue, and you go live into a mountain, and this and that, but, you know, you, you can't hide from your mind, and as long as you have these irritating, conflictual thoughts going on, and these crazy beliefs, it doesn't matter where you go, uh, you still got to face the same things. Wherever so, you are, there you are. There you are. I'm here too. I'm here too. Oh, yes. <laughs> so that helped uh, immensely, um, and and what I realized that I was on a search for the Christians call it salvation, and it's called the enlightenment sometimes in the East or self-realization. The Greeks call it know thyself. You know, it goes by different names, but it's just. And a true experience of the real me and the real will uh, that my Creator has for me. And uh, I'm happy to say that, that now it's really a constant experience. I really just, it's not, it's like I'm in it. Almost like a leaf that's finally decided to be carried by the river or the stream instead of fighting, uh, fighting the currents and telling the, the stream which way it should go. <laughs> Uh, it's just flowing. It's just there. But I've kind of yielded into that experience. And now my joy is to go around and, uh, and talk about uh, whatever uh, this experience seems to be in simple terms. Uh, when people ask questions and, uh, and let it express itself. Because it's, it's not so much the words, but it's a state of mind, really. It's, all, it's really just a state of mind. It's not a... Uh, like a theology or a, a conceptual thing. It's just a state of mind. And it's, uh, it's right here, it's right now, like Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's not uh, necessarily this thing that has to be way, way off in the future. It's actually experienced uh, by living in the present moment. It takes a lot of trust. Uh, I question so many beliefs about this world that um, that my life started to become more and more like otherworldly or uh, very different. Like for years, my biological father, as I was praying and meditating and contemplating and questioning and doing all this inner work, uh, my biological father was saying things like, uh, "Dirty, lazy, no good, rotten bum, get a job." Uh, so you see. Uh, it doesn't always register <laughs> uh, initially, especially with uh, those associations that you seem to have known that kind of know the old you. Uh, no matter how much work you do, sometimes they show up and they go, just who do you think you are? I know you. Like when Jesus went to Nazareth and there was no miracles, it was like, don't give me this Messiah business, you know. I watched you grow up uh, from a little, I know your parents. Don't try to tell me this uh, uh, before Abraham was, I am stuff, you know, I'm not going for it. You're just a human being, I know, I watched you grow up and, you know, and there were no miracles because, surprise, surprise, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're so anchored in the past, how can you be aware of something that's, you know, an out of pattern experience? So I had the same thing for me for years, um, and little by little, even the biological parents turned around, because they were witnesses to my mind, from angry and distant and changing the conversation, you know, when I would bring up miracles or whatever, to uh, eventually a uh, biological father calling me and saying, uh, Dave, I'm back. He had been like a youth minister years ago before he got caught up into the heavy ways of the world. And he was like, all that stuff you've been talking about for years, I understand it now. I, I know you, I know what you're talking about, and just kind of flipped around. And at one point, um, it was like I remember s sitting with uh, the biological parents and telling a Yogananda story. Uh, there was an Indian saint who, at the end of his life, he was sitting around with those, all of his disciples and apostles, and uh, he basically said, "This is it. I'm I'm leaving you. I'm, I'm ascending tonight." And uh, just left the body. Uh, the body remained in a state of non-decay for, for weeks and weeks. And as some of the d disciples gasped, 
as, as he took his final breath, I was telling this story uh, to the biological parents. In the past, they would have changed the subject, uh, talked about the weather, talked about the sports, uh, walked into the other room, something or other. They're sitting there smiling as I'm telling this story with these you know, eyes, looking me right in the eye, and I'm going on and on with the whole story to the very end of it. They're smiling, almost assuredly like, yeah, yeah, we know, we know this, we know this thing now. And at the end of it, they, Jack, who was my biological father, who was the most resistant of all, uh, very angry for many years, he smiled and he said, uh, well, if, if you decide to do that, uh, just don't do it in our living room, <laughs> because we don't want to have to clean the body up. <laughs> Made a joke without breaking eye contact, with a big grin on his face. And I was like, oh my goodness, I thought, so it's really getting to be like the end of the world. And then, a while later, um, uh, Jack was in talking to his minister at this traditional Christian church where I had been raised and confirmed, much of a traditional church. Uh, the last place I'd ever think I'd ever see again in my life. And Jack was talking to the minister there, who even the minister had had, had a, a near-death experience, had been on Oprah, had written a book, traveling around to, to Great Britain and everything. I thought, this is interesting. It's all a reflection of my mind. And now the minister at my old church is is teaching a class on mysticism in, the, in this traditional church. I thought, this is really strange. And so Jack, the biological father, went up to him one day, and they were studying, you know, St. John of the Cross, and St. Teresa, and St. Francis, and, you know, all of the, the saints and mystics. And he went up to the minister and said, uh, my son is one of those. <laughs> and the minister said, uh, one of what? <laughs> a, a mystic, a saint. And the minister was like, oh, and, uh, and, and, and Genesis is the same Jack, remember? Dirty, no good, lazy, rotten bum, <laughs> get a job, Jack. He said uh, to the minister, he said, um, I think you should invite him to the class on mysticism. And the minister said, okay, we'll do that. So I go there to this traditional church, and uh, there is the biological mother, the biological father, my biological sister, and who is crying, she's just watching the whole thing unfold, just crying. It reminded me a little bit of that uh, scene in the Bible, you know, where Jesus says to the apostles, who do you say that I am? And they, you know, John the Baptist, and Elisha come again, and you know, Peter says, you are the living Christ. Uh, and he says, that is not man who spoke. Well, that's what was going to unfold here at this church. I was sitting there, and uh, they, the, Jack asked the first question, and the question was, um, if you could ask Mother Teresa any question, what would it be? And I said, I had no questions. I had to be honest. And that kind of launched us into this mystical session at this very traditional church. And at one point in the middle of it, with a lot of lively questions and me teaching all kinds of, kind of radical ideas, um, this woman, there was a silence and a reverence there. And then this woman said, um, who is speaking to us now? And I didn't feel any guidance to put a name to it, you know, uh, in terms of this, this being or that being. Because it's just the presence of love, it's just the I am presence that we all share. Uh, that really, you can give any name you want to it or no name, it's still what it is. So I just smiled and I looked at the woman and just smiled and nothing came. And then after about 20 seconds, Jack, the biological father, spoke up and said, It's Jesus, he whispered. It's Jesus is speaking to us now, in his congregation, <laughs> in his Christian church. And inside I went, that's it. That's the end of the world. Uh, you can imagine your biological father or mother saying something like that, uh, you know, as you've been doing this inner work. After uh, so many years. After so many years of... Right, yeah. of everything but that. So I just, it was like, kind of like, okay, now there's my will. Now there's my free will when, <laughs> when I have a witness like that. Okay, I got it, you know. It's joy, it's happiness, it's love, <laughs> and the past is washed away, because that was a symbol that the past, you know, touched 
could touch me not, you know, anymore. So that's, and that's pretty much just the way it is now. It's like a, it's a gentle, loving presence. There's no one to convince. There's no one to convert. Uh, that's why there's no proselytizing in true religion, because true religion is inner peace. And once you have an awareness of that, the last thing you'd ever want to do is try to convert somebody, because you see that everyone is you already. Uh, you're not going to try to, <laughs> to change their mind, because you've changed your mind and accepted your free will, and then you perceive everyone that you meet uh, there with you. So it's not like there's an enlightened being that gets it, and then there's these other poor beings that don't. It's really that when your perception changes, you see that everyone's included in that enlightenment. It's not this thing of, I've got it and you don't. It's, I've got it and hallelujah, <laughs> everyone's included. Of course, that's the way it is, because it's not, uh, there's no exclusion in free will. I just want to interject here, in, in Marianne Williams. Williamson. Williamson. Williamson, I've read that book three times. Yeah, Return to Love. Now, there's one thing in there where she sort of illustrates an idea that, um, you work for God now. And she compared it, like, during the SS, like if somebody in, in the SS doesn't, sitting in a bar, doesn't say, I work for the SS. It's talking to the Nazis. I work for the SS. It's like, it's an invisible sort of thing. I work for God now. Um, and you know whether you're working for God now or not. And that just struck <coughs> me very profoundly. Yes. Yeah. It's beautiful, because that is the feeling that, that um, and you don't have to have a name for it, and neither do you have to go around and tell people, I work for God now, but in your heart, uh, you feel connected to your source, you know, and you can call it God, or you can call it by whatever name that you want. I have so much fun with it now, because I'll go anywhere that I'm guided and invited. Uh, I know I'm... I can content to stay home and play with my three-legged cat and her sister and, and pretty much just watch the grass grow, uh, you know, because it's a state of contentment. It's a state that nothing has to change. Uh, it's a state that everything is just perfect as it is right now. And then when I get invitations, it's just my joy to go uh, wherever that is. But I remember I was in Texas, uh, the not this year, but last year, and I remember I was at a course group, and uh, they were going around introducing themselves, and came around to this guy, and he was like 76 years old, and he said, Hi, my name is Arthur. I'm an atheist. Uh, I, I don't uh, believe in God, but if there were a God, I think his name would be Arthur. He <laughs> <laughs> was, was so cute. And then he said, And I think... I feel in my heart that we're all connected, and I think we're all part of one mind. And I was like, hey, Arthur! It's like, to me, what people profess to believe in, uh, whatever it is, is, is uh, it doesn't matter to me now. I mean, I, I can see that they're who I am, and so I just keep meeting myself wherever I go, and fine, let them call themselves whatever they want, uh, and say whatever they want that they believe in, because love is an experience that's literally beyond belief. And in the Course in Miracles, Jesus said that belief is the domain of the ego, not the domain of the spirit. So all these seemingly separate beliefs are just like artificial constructs. And when I go to different countries, I just, I have a ball with everyone. Uh, it's small. They have translators that like follow me around. And then when the translators get stuck on a word, there's somebody in the audience that knows what it is, and it's like a group uh, translating thing going on. A friend of mine, when I first got my uh, passport, you know, she said, you're going down to Argentina, you know, there's going to be a problem. And I said, a problem? What, what's the problem? She said, a language problem. You know, you, they don't speak uh, English and you don't speak Spanish. And I said, oh, heavens, that's not a problem. And it wasn't. There was translators all over. There must have been seven, eight, nine, ten different translators while I was down there, you know, for a month. Uh, everywhere. I never had an issue. Uh, 
They left me in a car one time, uh, where they were in, uh, Carrie and some friends were in buying uh, plane, or train tickets, and they left me with the cab driver uh, in the front seat. And they knew that, th that I didn't speak any Spanish, and that the cab driver didn't speak any English. And they were in buying the tickets looking out, and they saw us with our hands moving and talking, and they were all inside the train station going, what is going on out there? How can they buy that? They don't, they don't speak the same language. Well, when I was younger, I had watched a lot of tennis. And I remembered Argentina and uh, the tennis players, you know, Jose Luis Clerc and uh, Guillermo Vilas and this and that. So I just started throwing out some names and his, he got all excited. It just so happens that he was, had grown up with tennis his whole life and he had seen these, these players and known them. And he got so excited and we were just having a great time and they were all thinking, what are they doing? And we looked like we were having so much fun, but, but they didn't think we spoke the same language. But the Holy Spirit threw in a few ones, you know, I know a few words, si, hola, you know, adios, and a few of them, but, but I had Jose Luis Claire and Guillermo Vilas, and off we went. So that's really what it's about. It's, it's about the connection of the heart, and, and really just being willing to let that shine, and then you start calling forth all these witnesses in your life, and, and it's really beautiful. I mean, it, 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 it's really a heart-to-heart -heart connection that's, that's there. Uh, another example, I go down there uh, in 2003 in March, and uh, I'm like halfway through my 19 consecutive Course in Miracles healing gatherings on 19 consecutive days. It's worked out just so perfect. And the United States started dropping bombs on Baghdad, uh, right in the middle of my healing tour. Anti-American protests break out in the streets. There's people marching and screaming and hollering. There's banners across the thing. I'm just kind of watching it all very innocently, like, oh, what's all this? And, uh, and there's a big banner across the street, and it's in Spanish. And it's, I said to one woman who's with me, what does that mean? What does that say? And it said, uh, she's translated, Senior Bush, take up knitting. And I went, oh, how sweet. <laughs> Such a loving banner. Take up knitting. They have translators that like follow me around, and then when the translators get stuck on a word, there's somebody in the audience that knows what it is, and it's like a group uh, translating thing going on. A friend of mine, when I first got my uh, passport, you know, she said, you're going down to Argentina, and there's going to be a problem. And I said, a problem? What, what's the problem? She said, a language problem. You know, you, they don't speak uh, English, and you don't speak Spanish. And I said, oh, heaven, that's not... A problem, and it wasn't. There was translators all over. There was been seven, eight, nine, ten different translators while I was down there, you know, for a month, uh, everywhere. I never had an issue. Uh, they left me in a car one time, uh, where they were in. Uh, Carrie and some friends were in buying uh, plane or train tickets, and they left me with the cab driver uh, in the front seat. And they knew that, th that I didn't speak any Spanish, and that the cab driver didn't speak any English. And they were in buying the tickets looking out, and they saw us with our hands moving and talking, and they were all inside the train station going, what is going on out there? How can they buy that? They don't, they don't speak the same language. Well, when I was younger, I had watched a lot of tennis. And I remembered Argentina and uh, the tennis players, you know, Jose Luis Clerc and... Uh, Guillermo Vilas and this and that. So I just started throwing out some names and his, he got all excited. It just so happens that he was, had grown up with tennis his whole life and he had seen these, these players and known them and he got so excited and we were just having a great time and they were all thinking, what are they doing? They, they looked like we were having so much fun but, but they didn't think we spoke the same language. But the Holy Spirit threw in a few ones, you know, I know a few words, si, hola, you know, adios, and a few of them, but, but I had Jose Luis Claire and Guillermo Vilas, and off we went. So that's really what it's about. It's, it's about the connection of the heart, and, and really just being willing to let that shine, and then you start calling forth all these witnesses in your life, and, and it's really beautiful. I mean, it, 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 it's really a heart-to-heart -heart connection that's, that's there. Uh, another example, I go down there 
uh, in 2003 in March, and uh, I'm like halfway through my 19 consecutive Course in Miracles healing gatherings on 19 consecutive days. It's worked out just so perfect. And the United States started dropping bombs on Baghdad, uh, right in the middle of my healing tour. Anti-American protests break out in the streets. There's people marching and screaming and hollering. There's banners across the thing. I'm just kind of watching it all very innocently, like, oh, what's all this? And, uh, and there's a big banner across the street, and it's in Spanish. And so I said to one woman who's with me, what does that mean? What does that say? And it said, uh, she's translated, Senior Bush, take up knitting. <laughs> and, uh, oh, how sweet. <laughs> Such a loving banner. Take up knitting. That's the, that's the kind of protest uh, uh, that you, you, you could really give yourself over to. So I go to the gathering, and I get there, and I get to the gathering, and the, the questions, you know, right off the bat, you know. The first one was, um, what is your position on your president? <laughs> and, you know, I'm in the middle of my healing gathering, and, and I said, I have no president. And they translated it back to her in Spanish and then came back, uh, uh, what do you mean? Uh, don't you understand the, the question? And I, said, uh, I said, no, it's not really understandable. I said, I said, we're all children of God. We all come from love. We can't let these ideas and beliefs of nationality and, and politics and whatever get in the way. We're, we're all in love. Uh, that's what we're here for. It's just to share all the love. And some of the heads started nodding, 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 and, I, and then uh, I said, uh, remember, it's like the Beatles, like John Lennon said, uh, and then I broke out into singing, uh, imagine, imagine there's no heaven, I wonder if you, but I read, I got to that part, uh, imagine there's no country, I wonder if you can, nothing to kill or die for, a brotherhood of man, they all started singing. <laughs> with me, yeah. in English, yeah. and on keys, yeah. and I had, I had chills going up and down my spine, I was just like, whoa, it was like the reflection of my mind, I showed up there just totally in love with everybody, and not in the least bit thinking of, of, of conflict or war or whatever, which is just the whole construct that would show separation, and then I, I did quote a passage from A Course in Miracles where Jesus says, the war against yourself is almost over now. The war against yourself. That know thyself is the end of war. Uh, it, it's to hold on to this imposter belief system, and this alien will of the ego, that that's what the war is. And that this whole world has been a projection of, of an identity confusion of forgetting who we really are, and then projecting it out as if there's the evil ones, or the scapegoats, pointing the finger, blaming, buying into the illusion, and this ego wants us to keep pointing the finger at each other, instead of forgiving, and realizing that we really are in love. We really do have so much love inside. So after I sang the, you know, Imagine There's No Country, and, and that whole thing, and everyone sang with me, we were all just basking in all this love, and uh, all the heads were then nodding. And the, claro, claro, like, ah, he's got it. One of, someone said, he's got it. <laughs> and we all laughed together. And that was the, the spirit of all the gatherings. Uh, it, it was more like revivals, you know, where people were just laughing and talking. 